Okay, today I have the pleasure of talking to a guy who I consider a longtime friend. We got we met each other at a Max workshop some years ago and uh, have kind of stayed in loose contact over the years. Uh, we've gotten a chance to bump into each other uh, in many different places in many different ways. His name is Stephen James Taylor. And he is a person with a very fascinating career and a fascinating set of interests. So rather than me trying to explain it, what we're going to do is, first of all, say hi to Stephen. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Hi, Darwin. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have you tell us about how you identify yourself. Tell us a little bit about how you think of yourself and what some of the work is that you've been doing lately. Okay. Um my training is as a composer. I have a music degree from Stanford. Uh, and in the 70s and 80s, that's what I was doing, like concert music and, and film music. Um, but I guess more in the last five years or so, I've kind of rebranded myself as a music-oriented content creator uh, because of the evolution of technology. It's, it's come such a long way from when I started that it seems nowadays more the norm that any creative person has their hand in different media. It's one of the reasons I was drawn to Max in that it's sort of um, platform agnostic. Right. And uh, I don't know of really any other program that has that kind of scope. Um, but I think it's also endemic of our times where, you know, just about anyone you meet who's creative knows a little bit about Photoshop, a little bit about video editing, a little bit about putting making beats a little bit about uh writing you know and and um uh so coming out of the music background i've sort of applied my skill set uh, as much as i can to some of these uh other areas like filmmaking and graphics and and uh, sound design sure that's that's actually really interesting but it's also a very kind of a modern approach to being a media artist right is that you have you do have to be willing to take on a lot of things and as long as you have kind of your own voice you know generally developed in one of the disciplines as long as you have your own voice you can a lot of times uh bring that voice to other kinds of media as well yeah i i'm i i, I think it would be harder to come into all of them at the same time. It's a question I always pose to people, you know, based on that um, that uh, idea of Malcolm Gladwell's that, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to master something. Right. But if you draw the analogy to $10,000 in the bank, does it matter if you have $2,000 in five different banks? It's still 10 grand, <laughs> right? Right, right. <laughs> So if you're 2,000 hours as a cello player, 2,000 hours as a dancer, 2,000 hours as a script writer, you know, would it all amount to to mastery? I, I, that's debatable. Right. Um, but it, I would assume it would if your art form involved cello writing, you know, sound yeah. design. You know, yeah. if all those things were sort of your performance art, then, yeah, that might be 10,000 hours. Right. I, I also think that there's something to be said for if you're skilled in one area of the media arts, then yeah. uh, you can learn a lot by just diving into one of the others, into something else. So if you're an experienced, uh, if you're an experienced musician, jumping into filmmaking is a real valuable exercise. You know, the first time you do it, you're probably not going to be good at it, but yeah. Um, what you will do is you will have, you know, a lot of the things you learned as a musician, pacing, timing, uh, the narrative curve and all that stuff. It's got it's got its equivalents in film, film editing and stuff like that. So there's ways to take some of those concepts and really reuse them in a different context. Yeah, certainly with those two, you know, the, the, the generically you're carving a block of time. Right. So it doesn't matter if you're carving it with visuals or carving it with audio. Right. Those translate easier, say, than sculpting. Yeah. If I want to make a transition to sculpting, that might be a little hard because I kind of wouldn't know where to start. You know? Right, right. Uh, well, actually, uh, you're a L.A. professional, so the way that you start off being a sculptor is by hiring a sculptor to do your work for you, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> not to leave this room, okay? Not to leave That's this room. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So um, one of the things, one of the ways that you really caught my attention was your interest in microtonal music. I guess that's the easiest thing to call it. And um, some of the experimentation that you personally have done in that area. And, and also you introduced me at that time to the work of Irv Wilson, which has kind of been a secret little fascination of mine ever since I heard about it. But uh, you're all in. Um, I think you even studied with him a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. I studied with him starting in 89 and then on and off for, say, the next 20 years. Interesting. What is it, what is it that's in you that makes microtonalism speak your voice or speak, speak to your soul? Because it's clear when I talk to you, you, you are very passionate about microtonal music. What is it about it that really speaks to you? Well, first of all, I've been. Some of us out here have been using a, a different phrase to describe it, R- rather than microtonal music, using the phrase transcendent tonality. Okay. Because then that includes the normal twelve tone equal scale that everybody else uses. Sure, sure. Okay. And it's basically embracing the full gamut of all possible tuning systems, known and unknown, in the universe. Um. And so that's what appeals to me, the idea of approaching any kind of new piece of music or, or sound sculpture uh, from the point of view of embracing all possible tone relationships without prejudice. Sure. And then sure. saying, okay, which, which one? You know, it's sort of like in, in quantum physics, embracing a quantum field of all possibilities, and then you collapse what they call collapse the wave function to one reality. So if you embrace all possibilities and say, but this is the one I choose right now, Mm-hmm. You're basically uh, eliminating all those other ones for that moment, but maintaining the awareness that that any of these systems are are viable and usable at any at any given moment. Sure. So by sort of transcending any one of them, um, it, it's really more of a mindset that I think is broader than say in in, in more of an old school sense. People like Harry Parch, who's probably the most well-known American uh, microtonal composer. I think he died in the 70s. But, you know, a guy like him in, the, in those times had to, had to do all the theory first, in a way, and understand what it was that he wanted out of instruments. Then he had to go build them out of wood and metal. Right. And, you know, so you, so you better be damn well sure you like the scale. <laughs> right. Before you build all that. Then once he built them, he had to learn how to play all of them. And then he had to teach musicians to play them. And um, so then you're invested at that point in one tuning system. Yeah. Now, it turns out his is incredibly viable. Um, and, uh, but he didn't have the freedom in his time to say, well, what would happen if I you know, changed these notes all around? Well, then you'd have to change all of the acoustic instruments. Right. So with, with the electronic music, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, arena to experiment with uh, different kinds of tonal relationships, the distances between the notes. Um, the, 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 another way to describe microtonality is, is uh, I like to draw the analogy of a ruler. Like a ruler has 12 inches, so they're equally spaced in a foot. If you erase the face of the ruler so it's just blank and start drawing your own inches at different places, you know, say one example would be centimeters. You know, right. if, if you put 31 centimeters, that's roughly a foot. Um, that's a whole different system of measurement. Sure. So if you place your tones, you know, maybe you only want to use five of them and they're unequally spaced. You, you end up with different kinds of tonal realities that I believe affect your body differently. Um, and anyone who experiments with, with it just a little bit says, wow, that, ooh, that scale really feels different. Yeah, that's it's interesting because most people tend to think of like pitch tracking and stuff like that and in relative terms, right? So that we hear right. things relative to a starting point and all that stuff, which would tend to make you think, well, if I have a five note scale, how weird could it possibly sound? How disconcerting could it possibly sound? But I certainly know from from my own playing around with with uh, strange scales. That there, some of them are 
kind of like physically uncomfortable. Yeah. Or some of them are physically very soothing. Right. And it's it's really it's really a curiosity because it sort of like transcends what most people expect, which is that, well, you know, notes notes is notes, right? Right. But not. <laughs> yeah, but not. Indeed. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about your background. One of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking about people's background and how they get to be the artists that they are. Composition degree from Stanford sounds like a pretty heady uh, first end point. There were obviously some some ways you know waysides along that journey. How did you grow up to be a composition major at Stanford and a film and concert composer and now a person that is a digital artist. How did, tell me a little bit about the background that sets you up for that. Kind of a kind of a zigzag pattern, I guess. I started my first instrument was clarinet at eight years old. My mother made each of her kids choose an orchestral instrument, and you had no uh, choice but to study for four years, take lessons, and then you had the right to quit, which I promptly did after the four. <laughs> because I wanted to play electric guitar and they wouldn't allow me to do that because they thought I'd get involved with the kids that did drugs, which I did anyway. So, there you go. Uh, but so what I had to do then was then I got a paper route and saved up money to buy an electric guitar uh, by the time I was like 14. And then I had, you know, rock bands and, and, uh, and such through junior high and high school um, and didn't read a note. Uh, but because of my mother forcing me to read music, I, had, I knew how to do that. So when I got to college, I did not go there to study music. I, like any other 18 year old, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, and then my second year there made the mistake of taking a music theory course. Mm -hmm. and, and it grabbed me by the throat because <laughs> it, it was sort of like that moment in The Wizard of Oz where the dog pulls the curtain back. Right. And you see, oh, it's all being done by a guy behind a curtain. I, it did that to the to some of the magic and mystery of pop music. It was like, oh my God, these chords go in families, and that's all this is, you know. And then I realized, oh my God, there's not that much to it. Right. <laughs> um, so then I I said, oh, I better change my major because this is going to. Uh, it, it put me into an existential crisis because I realized at that moment, an anything else I went into. Um, I, I did this little exercise where I said, okay, imagine yourself becoming, say, a lawyer. Um, at the end of the day, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go home and play guitar. <laughs> and then I said, well, okay, imagine yourself as a professional guitarist. At the end of the day, are you going to go home and read law books? <laughs> right, right. No, it doesn't go the other way. So, right. So what I was, you know, it was a way of, of tuning into what I was trying to tell myself, which was, this is your only option, go for broke. So, so I... Uh, I became a music major at that point, and had I not known how to mute, to read music, I would not have been able to make make it. So when I finished uh, the the composition program there, I I, I um, had a second existential crisis, which was, do I want to be Jimi Hendrix or do I want to be Igor Stravinsky? Uh, in in those days, those were pretty separate paths. Nowadays, people are doing all kinds of synthesis of, of different things, but. Um, so I kind of kept one foot in each, um, you know, playing in rock bands and progressive jazz fusion bands and, and then trying to write string quartets and all that kind of stuff and uh, learning the, the language of free atonality, which I was drawn to at the time, Ludislavsky, Ligeti, Berio, people like that. Sure. Uh, and then um, my crisis was solved when I took a, six-week class in film scoring here in L.A. And uh, the teacher, Albert Harris, said, well, you got to know everything. He says, one week you'll need to write like Ravel, the next week you'll need to write like Duke Ellington, the next week you'll, you know, you might be asked to write something that's rock-oriented. And I said, oh, my God, and you get paid for this? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so that pretty much solved the crisis. I said, wow, I could get paid to kind of do all of them. Uh, the... I, I also will have to say that the, 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 the ladder I climbed in my career got burnt in a fire. It, it kind of doesn't exist anymore, that, that world of apprenticing with composers and, and, uh, 
uh, you know, there were there were opportunities there. You know, in, in breaking into as a film composer in the late '70s, early '80s, you had to know how to conduct and to orchestrate. Right. So that checked a lot of people at the door. You know, said so there might be a few hundred people trying to break into as opposed to a hundred thousand. You know, right. Um, so. Um, so I, I did that for a long time, keeping. So I, I started out writing uh, music for cartoons as a ghostwriter for a company called Ruby and Spears, and also for Hanna Barbera, doing Popeye and things like that. Then in the early 80s, I got a break as a ghostwriter for Mike Post and Pete Carpenter, who at the time had six to eight different TV series and needed to hire uh, a staff of composers to help them just deliver make their deadlines each week. Right. Uh, and it was a great time to do that because every TV show at that point, TV show and movie had to have an orchestra. Uh, it was before there were sequencers, before there was even, um, uh, you know, VHS, you know, because you, you would have to go look at the picture in the editing room and then remember the scene when you went home and, and wrote for it on the piano, because okay. that's all you had. You know? Right, right. Um, and then write out everything in pencil. And, and so for the longest time, I made my living with a pencil. Um, and so over all that time, you know, fast forward to today, where every everything is computerized, uh, and, and you don't need a pencil at all. Uh, uh, so... So the way that that evolved, though, so through, all through the 80s, I was writing chase music for cop shows, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, in spare time, doing all this dissonant, atonal, contemporary classical stuff. What led me to my third existential crisis was after doing a bunch of it, I would, you know, if, if I was lucky enough to hear any of it, because it was always hard to get things played, because th those kind of, that kind of music is very hard and demands rehearsal time and... Um, and so whenever I would hear something, I would kind of like it, <laughs> but not really. Right. Um, you know, it was just so abstract and dissonant. And it was hard to make things really ballsy <laughs> uh, in that language. But I got fluent in that, in that sort of free atonality, quasi-serial type language and uh, decided, ah, I kind of don't want to do this. And I, I didn't see it really going anywhere. Okay. And the other trend in classical music at the time was minimalism, which I didn't like because I felt it lacked drums and bass. <laughs> you know, why? <laughs> it's like, why even bother doing that? Just make it pop music and, you know, and, and go to the rig. Um, so, um, so, so that kind of kind of wandered the desert creatively for a few years because I couldn't figure out, gee, I'm not going to warm the water writing this atonal dissonant stuff because there are people who do that already really well. And I'm not sure I want to be one of them, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I don't want to go the minimal route. Um, so I didn't feel I had a home in terms of my actual real musical identity of my musical soul. Sure. And then when I met Irv Wilson, it was like, you mean I can get my triads back without having to go to the 19th century to get them? <laughs> you know, because I didn't want to have to go back to older harmonic language. Right. That right. wasn't an option either, you know. Because that's already been done and written really well by pretty much everyone who's come before us, you know. Right. So, so this was like, wow, this is a whole other universe, and so that fucked my head up, and it's still it's still pretty messed up <laughs> as a result of, <laughs> of that because that, it was kind of getting exposed to a, 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 a sort of breadth of possibilities that still floors me. How how wide that that realm is the different things you can do with it. Um, and so that has led me today. So whenever I begin a project now, I always begin with the idea that I'm going to use whatever note combinations are, are best for whatever I want to do creatively and then have to give myself a reason like why not to. For example, if it's a project about a country western musician and they want music that sounds authentic, Mm -hmm. It's not a microtonal project. I'm sorry. Right, <laughs> right. You better stick with exactly what that is. But then there are other opportunities. Like I have a movie that's going to come out this year, a national uh, release, a Miramax picture called South Side with You. And it's a it's a love story about Barack and Michelle Obama's first date. And uh, so you would think, well, how would you score that? You know, late 80s, 
Chicago. Well, I used a 31-tone scale through most of it. Mm -hmm. Because the major triads in a 31-tone scale are perfectly in tune. They don't beat. So when you have these moments of quiet between two people who are falling in love, hitting these beautifully in tune chords really affect you physically in a, in a way that... Uh, and and the, the score is very simple that way. It's, mm -hmm. it's just a lot of major chords, but the, they're not the major chords of your grandfather. They're, right. they're really in tune. The thirds are flat. And um, and they don't beat. So you you have a, I had special guitars made uh, to be able to that have 31 frets per octave, and then I tuned all the synths to to be in the key that, that I tuned it to. Right. And um, and so you wouldn't necessarily think you know coming into a project like that. Well, this could this could be microtonal, but when I hit that first chord for the director Richard Tan, he said, "That's it. Whatever that is, I want that." Interesting. <laughs> um, and and so and so the, it's kind of this more broad perspective is sort of opening up. I mean, Paul Simon's new album, he he's got a song on it where he actually went to Princeton and used some of the old Harry Parch instruments. Now I'm dying to hear what he did with them. Um, uh, and I think Beck also has one. He wrote a song about Harry Parch. So so the the uh, pop pop world is starting to open up to this too in the in the mainstream. Right. And I think it will go in a very interesting direction because when you think really about where can music go, that's one of the few areas that it really can grow for a long time. That is really pretty fascinating stuff. I'm Now, I'm curious about a lot of things related to that. And first of all, for people who aren't familiar with Irv Wilson's work, can you give us like a three or four minute overview of what that's that's about? Yeah, that's... I know it's kind of kind of like trying trying to take the Pacific Ocean and put it in a cup. But I think the best description of him is a musical or harmonic cartographer, kind of a map maker, uh, someone who's charted you know large swaths of territory, uh, much of which is unexplored, um, and he he did so through the use of um, some pretty simple math that would sort of open up. Uh, these, how would you say it? He he creates these entities in a way. They're 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 little mathematical entities that create scales. So it's a syst He has systems that create subsystems of tunings. So unlike Harry Parch, who who invented a, a new mousetrap, right? Eric Wilson examined mousetrap nests, <laughs> and <laughs> and then once you embrace that, you're able to then create thousands of new scales yourself. One of the guys who studied with the Marcus Hobbs wrote this incredible app that he continues to improve on called Will Sonic. It's a it's an iPad app. Yeah, believe me, I got it the second that it came out. It, it's amazing. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> well there you go. See that's pretty much all a beginner needs to at least get their start getting their head and hands around the vastness of the of the territory. And you know you can take a you know, a, a pentatonic scale, and then change the, the the size of the steps in between, and, and get all of these different uh, possibilities. Then when you find one you like, you can uh, export it as a scale file, and then your synths can be tuned to that, and you can get oh. access to all of, the, all of your patches. Right. So I have a YouTube video that is a really sped up two minute version of kind of how that works. And it shows a little composition being written written in Omnisphere, mm -hmm. again with the Wilson app. You know, just exploring, finding a scale you like, export it, and off you go. Right. Now, one of the things that I certainly found uh, fascinating about Wilson's uh, the cartography methods that he uses, or or your your concept of sort of like the mouse trap, the essence of mouse traps, mouse trapness is that so much of it has like this geometric nature to it or almost like yeah. a 3d geometry and when you see mm -hmm. it 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 not only has like this musical connection to frequencies but there's this sort of like innate beauty in the lay of the thing just in graphical terms <clears throat> um so in your time spent with and around him i mean was there did you get a sense that 
that beauty was part of what drew him into doing this? Without a, without a question. Um, he has a remarkable ability to visualize things in three dimension. Uh, apparently when he was in the Air Force in the 40s, they gave him some sort of aptitude test having to do with spatial visualization. Mm -hmm. And they say he, had, he scored the highest of anyone in history before that. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, and so what, essentially what Irv does is he hears these tonal relationships and then he maps them to polyhedra, to, to three-dimensional objects. So when you went over his house, they'd be, they'd be filled with these th complex three-dimensional objects that he had built out of sticks and styrofoam balls. And, and whenever you would ask him a question, he'd pull one out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and essentially what Marcus tried to do with the Wilsonic app is to squash that down into two dimensions so that you could do something Irv couldn't do, which was when you touch one of those styrofoam connectors to actually hear it. To hear their um, yeah. But the, the cool thing about it is that the any of those, those notes are usually extrapolated from a minimal set of, of, of relationships, like say the relationship of four to seven to nine to 11. Right. And then you extrapolate all the multiples of that. So there's nothing magic about those numbers. You can change it to five to six to eight to nine or something. You know, you can change the variables. That's a new concept. The idea that 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 you are embracing variables in the creation of a scale, but the but the relationships in as they're mapped to that three dimensional object stay the same. So that say every every um, if you imagine say like a a pyramid shape. You know, the, the, the top of it would be one note and the, you know, the four bases would be, four, you know, four other notes. Right. The relationship of that angle from one of the one points on the ground to the center um, will always say be a perfect fifth or, 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 or a major third or whatever you determine. So as you add more complex stellations of that object, those angle, the relationship, anything parallel to that will always have the same uh, interval oh, right, sure. based on what your starting values were. So that, that's the thing. It's a little bit hard, I think, initially to, to, to get your head around the, the, the sort of Wilson universe, which is it's variables. It's not fixed values until you decide that they're going to be fixed. Yeah, you decide some point, to, some frequency to lock them into. Right. Bam, yeah, right. So in, in practical terms, in working with these kind of uh, these kind of unique scales or tuning systems or whatever, I mean, you mentioned already having to, you know, have uh, special guitars constructed. Or, you know, if you, if you pour Scala files into a soft synth, it'll do your scale, but actually finding a surface that matches that is going to be a yeah. tough sled, and it seems to me, you know, in the case of the guitar, you have to you have to change your technique. In the case of a keyboard, you have to actually change the nature of the instrument, don't you? Yeah, um, it kind of depends on what you're playing around with. If you're playing around with alternate ways of tuning twelve notes, yeah, they'll map right. great onto the keyboard you already know. Sure. Or less if it's you know say five notes or six notes per octave, you know you just finger them chromatically, uh -huh. um, and you can get around. But when you start getting into like thirty-one, like what I have, then that's two octaves and a half right. for for on a keyboard to hear one octave. So you know an eighty-eight key keyboard will only give you not even three octaves. Right. Yeah. So that gets a little uh, cumbersome, and you end up doing a lot of step loading. Yeah, okay. um, but I but that's why Irv in, invented this uh, and designed this alternate keyboard that uh, that was produced for a few years by Star Labs called the Wilson Microzone. The one I have is uh, nine hundred eight hundred and ten keys, oh my and they're all hexagonal, <laughs> and and they're generalized, and so it's quite a it's it's quite a a, a beast to to ride. But right, right. actually. If if you started a five year old who had never seen a piano, I think they would figure out the big one, the the hexagonal one, easier, right. because it's generalized. One of the things about the piano that I I just doesn't make any sense to me is that you know you play a, a major chord in the key of C, 
it's all white keys. You you play mm -hmm. it in D flat. It's two blacks, one white. The mm -hmm. key of D, it's two whites, one black. You know, there's twelve different shapes that your hands have to remember it. But it's the right. same chord. Right. On a general keyboard like the Wilson uh, 990, you know, um, once you got the shape of a chord, major, minor, whatever, anywhere you slide that, it'll be the same shape. So, you know, any kind of modulation doesn't involve having to learn a new fingering. Sure. How how available were these keyboards? Because I've actually seen the picture of you with with this thing, which is sort of like it looks slightly smaller than a football field, you know, covered yeah. with little hexagonal buttons. I mean, uh, uh -huh. were did were uh, there a fair number of them made, or were they pretty hard to come by? They were kind of hard to come by. You had to kind of he he would make them per order. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and uh, it was a it was not a money making proposition. Right. Uh, so eventually, he just couldn't make them anymore, yeah. um, and they're no longer available. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Snyder yeah. uh, made one called the Manta, which is uh, also hexagonal. Incredibly cool instrument. It's only forty eight keys. It's for Max, so you have to have Max in the mix. And it's a, l a little bit hard to set up once you get it set up. Uh, that thing is phenomenal. Uh, and then there are apps now, iPad apps, I think, that have hexagons. But again, there's nothing really super simple out there. Yeah. Uh, there are a few other hexagonal keyboards that other people have made, physical ones. You know, the problem is there's no one... When you open up this broader universe, you when you get into a physical interface to access it... Yeah. Uh, like a keyboard, um, there's no one that's absolutely perfect. Right. So the more flexible, the nice thing about the Wilson 990 was, you know, each key was programmable to its own MIDI note number and channel. Right. So you could come up with, and, and we had software written for it that would show you the best fingerings for whatever scale you had. Mm -hmm. uh, ones that were, like you could make a 31-tone a scale really compact if you wanted to... Um, play chords and keep them within the reach of an of your hand right. uh, but if you wanted to play rapid chromatic stuff you could extrapolate a different kind of of design where the keys were really spread out so you could play rapid chromatic licks you know with just two fingers sure, sure. well that's actually interesting because you know when you were talking about spreading out a 31 tone scale across the standard keyboard all of a sudden the concept of triads gets to be a physical stressor because you're going to have trouble stretching your hands large, far enough to be able to pull off even a simple simple triad. Right. <clears throat> what, what Irv has on the uh, hexagonal keyboard is absolutely wonderful because the octave fits it beautifully within uh, your hand, the range of your hand. Mm -hmm. And um, the major triads are where you would expect them. So the way it's the way the thing is laid out, it's nice and compact. You just kind of turn a little bit to the side, and you get all these notes in between. So mm -hmm. between C and D, you might have four other notes instead of just one. Sure. But if you only want to play the twelve, the subset of twelve out of thirty-one, that, that's why it's such a good scale. That subset of twelve is very close to our twelve equal. Okay. Uh, a lot of people could be fooled by it. Interesting. Um, the major scale within it, the minor. And that's the beauty of it, because as soon as you want to get freaky, it's like, whoa, where did all these other notes go? <laughs> well, they, they're in the family. They're cousins. <laughs> right. They're actually mathematically related. But if you want to play just regular, you know, B flat to, you know, to G minor to E flat to F, you can do all that. Right. Because um, that subset of 12 is very, very close to what we're used to. Sure. But at this point, nobody is making a large format surface that, that'll handle this stuff not that i know of and that's where it gets kind of interesting because and that's why my preoccupation with physical instruments i mean that's what i came up on yeah, yeah. right right and uh yes a lot of microtonalists do everything in the box uh -huh. which is which is cool it's cool the fact that you can even do that um but as soon as you want to get something in the real world um which is where i think a lot of the magic and nuance comes from uh, you got to refret guitars, or you got to saw pipes, right. <laughs> to the, you know, or, or saw marimba bars, and then and then you're only able to lock into that w one, one thing rendering, you know. Yeah. 
so yeah, the, the closest thing was the, the Microsoft. But for somebody else to, to do that, wow, it's, you know, I was one of the people that kind of helped sort of produce that or finance that. It was on the development team with Star. We hired Harvey Star, Irv Wilson, Gary David, and I to actually build the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing what everything he went through, oh my God, <laughs> I wouldn't wish that. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Right, I hear you. Um, um, but but maybe with technology now, LEDs or something, there yeah. would be a way to do it more simply. Maybe so. Uh, it seems it seems curious, and and the the fact of the matter is, I think also there's a little bit of change in people's heads coming from things like what Ableton did with their scale layouts on the push. All of a sudden, people got used to the idea that, hey, when you have this arrangement across pads that has a musical nature to it, shapes yeah. become an important part of playing certain kinds of riffage, right? And, yeah. and I've seen people who were very comfortable playing on regular keyboards all of a sudden take on a very different playing persona when using shapes becomes a part of a playing style. You know, that's really an interesting point because certainly within this realm, you know, there are different ways of discovering stuff. You, mm -hmm. you can discover something with your ear. You can discover things with your hand, like what you're talking about with shapes. Right. Or with your eyes. Like, wow, what happens if I hit this one and that one and then reach over and get those? And then come down one, up one, down one, up one. You know, <laughs> right. you make up these patterns that are visual, and sometimes you say, I like the way that sounds. Yeah. So your eyes can find it, your ears can find it, or your brain can find it through math. Right, right. Right, you can say, well, what would happen if I multiplied each of these by three, then subtracted one, multiplied by three again? You know, yeah, yeah. it's the same thing. You're, you're riffing with numbers, or you're riffing with your hands, or you're riffing with your ears or your eyes. So there's like these four ways of discovering stuff. Shapes is really everything. I think what's going to be interesting and, and something that worries me a little bit is because it's so vast, it's really hard, hard. It's almost impossible that it would evolve in any one direction. Right, right. I mean, when you, when you think about the piano, you know, as imperfect as it is as an interface, all of the literature has been a result of the way those key, keys are yeah, laid out. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, think of a Ray Charles lick, you know, where it kind of slides off a black key onto a white key. You can only do that on the piano, right? Um, and and it's because of the way the piano is laid out that those licks were those really cool licks were born. So the exciting thing about having a different interface is you find new ones. Yeah, but the downside it seems like the, two of the downsides. One that I rant on constantly, which is that if there's a new interface every other week, how does anyone yeah. get to be a virtuoso at any of it? And then secondly. If there's a really, new interface every week or two, how does a pedagogy ever get built for that interface? Yeah. yeah. I'm disturbed by those same questions. Yeah. Uh, have been for a while and have not come up with what I think is a good hmm. answer because there may not be one. Yeah, there may not <laughs> I mean, be that's one. A, You're right. Yeah. You've really nailed it there, you know, and it's like, shit. Yeah, so we opened up all this with all of our, all you know, things like Max and things like, Ableton Live, and there's all these new possibilities. But look at the problem there is even now, without even considering the scale and tuning world, of of um, interfacing with another musician's stuff. You, you know, everyone's got their own little favorite plugins and this, that, and the other. Mm. Collaborating with somebody is not just like, hey, bring your guitar over and we'll write something. Right. You know, it's sort of like, okay, well, do you have that plugin? Well, how'd you get that sound? Because I don't have that. <laughs> Ah! Yeah. Well, now, it's interesting because you are one of the people that I think of as really embracing the physical instrument. And, and some of what you've done, I, I heard a piece that you did on a fretless guitar, which mm -hmm. was just wonderful. And it wasn't necessarily hyper-technique filled. Yeah. But it was just beautiful and expressive. And the way that you played it seemed like it would have been impossible to do in the box. Right. 
how much yeah, of there, how much of your current work do you think is related to the fact that you're willing to do stuff out of the box in real using real world tools and real world interfaces? Um, a, a lot of it, and I think that's part of the trick is trying to keep one foot in the analog world and one in the digital, uh, because ultimately everything ends up in the digital world. But right. to me, a lot of the magic and the nuance. We do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So um, the things you can do on a guitar or any kind of acoustic interface, the amount of programming it takes to imitate that is not worth it, I don't think, because it's never quite right. Yeah. And uh, unless you make it a thing in and of itself, like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this electronic sound be the thing, you know. Sure. Um, but, but I find myself all the time reaching more for... Uh, Acoustic stuff to the point where I've even got a new instrument I had built here about a year ago That's also I'm using now in everything uh, I, I call it the Transcendello a friend of mine who's a violin maker David Ravinas made this thing for me and it's a cross between a pedal steel and a um, and a cello uh, It has pedals that will bend the individual strings while you bow it Oh my! and, and what I found was um, because I've always wished I could play a, a string instrument like a like a you know violin, viola, or cello. Right. But it just takes too damn long to get good at it. Right. Um, and so with this thing, it took me about a year. And this last project I did, that's a PBS documentary on Maya Angelou, that's going to air this summer, uh, as part of the PBS Masterworks series. Um, I, I did some stuff with the live with the string quartet, playing along with it. Uh, and I actually blended in, and, and they turned around like, holy shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and what was really fun, Darwin was, each of them came up and tried to play it with their bows. Right. And they couldn't. They, they sounded terrible. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, but when I, you know, the, I, I had a solo I, I did in unison with the cellist, and he said, wow, he says, your phrasing is better than a lot of the people that play in my sections. Because I was able to just study and listen to how string players uh, phrase and then use this this sort of new instrument. The, the nice thing about it is I, I put underneath the strings, because there's a big distance between the string and the, and the actual, uh, uh, what would be a fretboard. There's right. no frets. But I, I have these printouts that I put under that are, okay, here's the 12 equal printout. So right. I'm able to cheat, basically, in my, <laughs> like a pedal steel player would, right? right he doesn't right. actually press down on the string. Right. and touch a fret, but he glides over it, and he has a guide so he knows when he's reaching up an octave, there's sure. my octave, right? Right, right. So it's like a pedal steel that way, but the cool thing is I could peel that template off and put a 31-tone template and very quickly go from step one of a 31-tone scale to step 26. <laughs> and nobody can do that, right? I mean, a string player can't. They, they, they couldn't hear that. You couldn't hear um, it or, or nail it. And the problem is I would assume with like these high note scales, nailing the exact pitch is really critical because the the tuning is probably a little bit more sensitive than yes. equal temperament tuning. Right, right. You wanna get it right. You can be out of tune in those systems too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so being able to look at this little cheat sheet underneath the string is great, you know? <laughs> nobody can see it but me. Right, right. <laughs> And say, yeah, I'm going to go from this note to that one, back down to that one. Um, and then you can program your synths after that to double it. And then you say, wow, that was not an accident. All of those instruments are hitting that exact same pitch together. It's labor intensive, but to me, the payoff is like, to me, that's the path forward is having just a handful of acoustic instruments that can add that kind of realism. Sure. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, very curious how Paul Simon used it in, in his new album. That's right. supposed to come out, I think, uh, next month. I think. Yeah, I think the song is called Insomniac's Lullaby or something like that. Okay. So I'm curious then, so you talk about getting this new instrument built and spending a year kind of getting some facility or, you know, skill with it. What does, what does your work day or your work life look like? Because it seems like, given the things that you're exploring – you have to dedicate a certain amount of time to research. You have to yep. dedicate a certain amount of time to skill building as well yep. as pumping out 
tracks for an animation or doing spotting for your next film work? How, how do you fit all of that into a working day? Um, I have no downtime, basically, other than when things break, which is often. Uh-huh. Um, but no, I, I don't. I mean, I call it lab work. And there's always a long list of things like, oh, I want to try using an Ebo on this thing, or I want to try, right. um, I want to try using that delay plugin with this, you know. And so um, you kind of do that, and you make little notes to yourself, like, okay, that would be good. But usually, a, a, a particular need will arise that will prompt me to have to do that. Sure. And then once I do it, it's usually project related. So I try to roll in some of the lab work to the actual work itself, but it's. Um, um, it's a little, it's a little unwieldy. I, I will have to say, <laughs> and and it, it drives me crazy. And I'm I'm glad I have a studio that's outside the home because I would, I, I can close the door at night. Uh, when I used to work out of my basement, I never was home, even though I was home. Right. You know, because this this stuff will will take as much as you can give it and more. So it's very very hard to I think. If you embrace this path to, to also have a balanced home life, I, right. I work really hard at work really hard at that. I know you're good at it. No, I'm not. I'm terrible at it. I work all the time, and my <laughs> my my wife and children, uh, when they when they imagine me, they imagine the back of my head staring into a screen. <laughs> oh boy. Well, <laughs> yeah. Not, not, I am okay, not good, good at the balance. <laughs> But you, you you understand what I'm saying? How hard it is because it's a it's a rabbit hole. It is, it is, and and it's endlessly fascinating. I mean, what what you're talking about, and and this is why I love talking to you, is I it it resonates with me. This sense of having a career that is as much of a voyage as it is a set of projects is really yeah. kind of interesting. But it's also it is a little overwhelming because you can give it every bit of time that you have and then some, and it, it will overwhelm all of that time. And every part of it will be fascinating, but it's just, it's, yeah. I, I watch my son when he plays like a, a really absorbing video game. And right. I, I don't really get into video games in that way, but I see how right. what I do is a different version of that. Yeah, you're, you're just not a first person shooter. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, anyway, it seems like you're you are on and you continue to be on some pretty fascinating journeys. Now, I'm I'm curious, given that your journey includes things like developing scales and developing new instruments and stuff like that. What, but also that you're kind of expanding into this idea of being a content provider rather than simply a composer. What, how do you imagine the next bits of instrumentation that you do? I mean, can you imagine things that are as useful to your writing or as useful to your graphic work as a new instrument is in your, into your music? Do you imagine things that are aids in those areas as well? Yeah, um, although I'd have to say I don't quite have the same kind of... Um background on the visual elements to say, hey, what I need here is a new plugin, you know, right. uh, or, or what I need here is a new paint or a new way to render color. Um, I, I, again, that's one of the things I'm drawn to with Max, but of course, Max is another rabbit hole in and of <laughs> itself, as I found out very quickly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that uh, I'm in awe of the people that know all of it, you know, the jitter and the sound design and the acoustics and the MIDI and the, you know, um, and the graphics and, and geometry and, and being able to rotate things and hear what they sound like. Um, so that, that alone is a, is a, but, but that's where, where I'm drawn to because at least that way, if I, if I do come up against a particular need that, uh, how do you say it? Ray, Ray and Charles Eames, the famous uh, designer said, innovate only as a last resort. Right. And so if there's something off the shelf you can grab, great. But, that's what's happened with some of these instruments where it's like, yeah, I'm going to have to innovate here because I'm, I'm feeling a need for something that is not off the shelf. Right. And if, there, if there's a quicker way to get there, then let's build something. Sure. Do you have any, do you have any instruments you're dying to build or are in the middle of building right now? 
Not, not at the present, uh, okay. because this uh, this Transcendelo has been such a project. I still need to drive it up to the uh, to, to my friend who made it in, in Oregon. Uh, he has to make a, a bunch of uh, final mods on it okay. that that I think will finally lock this thing in. But I put so much, you know, it's it's one of those things. There's a there's a how would you say it? You know, having all these instruments is like having a harem. Right. Which may, may not be as glorious as it sounds, because you can't remember all their birthdays. <laughs> right. There's a lot of maintenance involved, right. There's a lot of maintenance involved. And, and also a lot of skill in learning how to, um, how to make each one speak. So there's a tendency to kind of acquire more and more, as my wife will attest to. Um, <laughs> you, you know, and it's like, why do you need another instrument? Well, well this one does this, you know. And, and uh, the other ones don't. But at some point, you have to say, okay, well, how much time am I going to spend with each of these to really, really be able to do something convincing on them? Um, so I'm at a stage right now where I kind of want to just chill for a minute and try to get a little bit better on these things. Sure. Uh, so, you know, so I'm, all, I'm always kind of tinkering around with stuff to just try to figure out a new way into this and, and, and ways to solve uh, sonic problems that arise. Amazing. Well, Stephen, I want to thank you so much for the time that you dedicated to talking to me and uh, sharing your experiences and your ideas. Uh, as always, fascinating spending time with you. And um, I just hope that things continue to go as well for you as they seem to have been. Thanks a lot for your time and, and have a great day. Thanks, Darwin. Always, always very stimulating talking to you. <laughs> All right, man. Bye. Many thanks to Stephen for the time, uh, for the opportunity to talk about microtonalism, which is always a really interesting subject. It's one that's kind of hard to always embrace, but man, once you get into it, it seems like a lot of fun. Everybody I know that gets into it gets into it big time, right? Uh, beyond that, I want to just thank you for continuing to listen. Uh, continue to listen more. I've gonna, got a couple more here in the pocket before we head off to uh, Minnesota and then you'll probably hear the tone of my voice change because something I'm sure will change. It'll be awesome. Otherwise, I will talk to you next week. <laughs>